Hi, it's Jerry Roberts back with a new episode of Newsmakers Journal of the Plague Year. It is Friday, October 2nd. Donald Trump has tested positive for the coronavirus, but we're not going to talk about that. Uh, we are joined by uh, Santa Barbara Uber columnist uh, Nick Welsh, who has just emerged from the fortress of solitude where he has spent countless hours studying the 12 state ballot measures and has prepared the uh, independence uh, editorial positions on those. So uh, and this is one of us, our, uh, we do this so you don't have to shows. So we're gonna go through the ballot measures with Nick and, and get some detail and depth and idea about what's going on with those. Thanks for joining us, brother. How are you doing? Doing good, you know, it's a weird thing. Uh, you know, you don't want to float. Uh, but there's something reassuring in knowing that their actions actually have consequences and that what goes up does come down and that there is a natural order to the world where uh, we are no longer in suspended agitation about everything. I you don't wear a mask, you're going to get sick. Okay, but I know you're with me. I know you're with me in, in sending the president and the first lady thoughts and prayers uh I okay. thought prayer. all right I have so Go ahead. we got uh we have 12 ballot measures uh from uh, proposition 14 to proposition 25 rather than um uh talking about them in numerical order which makes no sense at all i'm going to try to categorize these a little bit and also uh talk first about the ones that we're seeing the most advertising on I think the most consequential is Proposition 15, which would change uh, iconic Prop 13 by creating a different way of assessing commercial property, apartments, uh, office buildings, shopping malls, and residential, so that um, that we would have a so-called split role assessment. So. Uh, property taxes would go up for commercial property, maybe as much as $12 billion a year. Uh, and uh, it wouldn't change for homeowners. What, what, what is the independent uh, recommending on Proposition 15? We are recommending a vote for it. And this one probably had the most uh, internal head scratching and deliberation uh, of any of them. Uh, you know, this is the one that, uh, uh, you know, is, you know, when Prop 13 was passed back in 1978, the voters were definitely under the idea this was going to keep Granny from being uh, uh, tossed out of her house because she couldn't pay the property taxes. But one of the collateral beneficiaries of all this uh, was the commercial real estate industry. And so all the landlords on State Street and all the commercial property owners throughout the state got a great piggyback right on this. And so the rates at which their property values were assessed um, were really kept on ice. And there's this very flourishing um, a cottage industry of uh, real estate finaglers who, even when these properties change hands, they don't really change hands so that the increase in property value, uh, which is billions and billions of dollars a year, um, that is, is not uh, vulnerable to taxation. The problem with that is, of course, um, we are in a pandemic and um, we need revenues and the federal government isn't providing them. We would have done this anyway because this has been you know, one of the unintended consequences of Prop 13, which, as we know, is the 11th commandment in California. Thou shalt not touch it. So we have this one. So we thought, you know, just in simple fairness, you know, this was not what was intended and, and it's not fair. And so this will put all the commercial property owners on a, a level playing field. More to the point, it also provides revenues, uh, you know, for schools and you know everything that we need. And unfortunately, only the federal government has the capacity to um, print money. Uh, state budgets have to um, be balanced. Um, that being said, this was tough because. How do you go 42 years of defrayed property tax valuation increases and then all of a sudden dump that in one fell swoop on, uh, on, on the owners and not expect that to sort of um, trickle down to uh, 
their tenants in a way that's going to break the bank. Right. And so, so here's the thing, you know, I, I, I was a big advocate for split role for many, many years uh, and would still be, but the point you just raised is exactly it. Is this going to spill over onto small business, 70% of whom rent property uh, in, in the state and thus be passed on to consumers? And if so, is this the right time? So I had, honestly, I'm going to write some more about this. I haven't made up my mind, but what, what about that issue? Is, isn't it going to raise uh, 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 rents for small business owners and then cost consumers? Um, inevitably, yes. The question is how much and, and, and how dramatically. Um, you know, one of the uh, uh, reasons we went the other way on this one, or went the way we did, is that you know, a lot of the commercial uh, tenants have leases. And their leases often, and most of them say, this is how much property taxes can go up by. And so in their triple net, um, you know, it, it sort of specifies what they can be charged. So to the extent that you know, this is going to be a big, massive hit, um, A, Prop 15 is going to be phased in over time. I don't think it's gradually enough. I think it should be more gradually. Um, but it's going to be phased in over time. Some tenants, many tenants, are going to be protected from it because they have leases. And the, the provisions won't, they, the landlords won't be able to pass that on until um, those leases expire. And uh, well, the reality by that time, I'm expecting, and, and um, is that rents will be down so much by that time because of COVID. Uh, and because the market is just going to, you know, take a beating because of the recession we're in, um, those tenants will, will be able to get rents at better prices. All right. That's a sort of long-winded way of putting yeah. it. But yeah. All right. Well, only 11 more to go now. So, uh, um, just the other consideration on, on that one, the, the ag interest raise a, 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 a issue. Which is yeah, let's. Uh, we we we, we got to move on. This is six thousand eight hundred and sixty-two okay. words. I know that you read every one of them, uh, but it's. Uh, okay. We, you know, just just that the, the the prime backers are the public employees unions, the teachers, and I think that this was not an unintended consequence of Prop Thirteen. I think it was the intended consequence. Howard Jarvis was head of the uh, Apartment Owners Association, and they've, they've gotten a huge break on this. So, okay. you know, that's a good point. I think we didn't know it. I, we yeah, were no, we lying yeah, to it. That, that wasn't part of the campaign. All right, let me, real quick, on two other things that are sort of related to housing and uh, uh, taxes. Prop 19 is one of the, it was put on by the legislature, and this is a real, you know, elephant in the dark kind of thing. It would allow seniors to take their low tax rate with them when they buy a new home so the realtors like it. It would also prevent people like Jeff Bridges, uh, who was the subject of a Los Angeles Times investigation, who inherit uh, properties and then rent them from keeping the low uh, uh, tax rate from Prop 13. But then it would give a bunch of money for firefighting in the state too. So how'd you come down on this one? We, we came down against this one. It was just, it, it, it gave us uh, You're whiplash. You're no on, no on 19? We're no on 19. It okay. gave us whiplash just because it, it seemed like it was moving in three different directions at the same time. And, you know, if you're going to do a ballot initiative, it needs to be simple and clear. And this one, you need a PhD just to explain it and yeah. another one just to understand it. I agree. Too many moving parts. And as we know, uh, historically, two thirds of initiatives have been turned down because people look at something that doesn't make sense or is head scratching and say, no, I think that's what's in store for this one. And then Prop 21, which revisits rent control, would take off the state uh, ceiling on uh, uh, rent controls uh, that affect locals. It would give all the power to the locals. We just voted on this two years ago, uh, but you guys are always for rent control. So how'd you come down on Prop 21? We actually came out against this one. And the argument, I mean, the ballot says what this is going to do, it's going to give local governments 
a broader authority uh, to impose even stricter rent controls than the, the one that was just approved by the state legislature two years ago. Which is 7%, and, right? It allows... Six percent is what it is now. So it's five percent plus the CPI. Okay. And so right now it's a six percent increase. Now that has just started to take effect. And, and we're just thinking, you know, there's all of these rental protections coming in all at once. You throw another one into the works at a time when landlords, um, many of whom are not the big property uh, you know, management companies, but the mom and pops are taking it into shorts because of COVID. They're not getting any kind of uh, mortgage relief. Um, and if you want tenants to be able to stay in their apartments, you can't totally squeeze these guys out. And, and it just seemed to me it was piling on at a time you couldn't afford to pile on. Yeah, agreed. So let's get one to take effect and figure out how they work. Yeah, I'm knowing on that one too. Okay, though, anybody who's watching TV at all uh, is seeing a lot of ads on Prop 22. Uh, the, there was a Supreme Court ruling in 2018 that said a lot of independent contractors had to be, who had been treated as independent contractors, i.e. no health care, no unemployment insurance and so on, had to be treated as employees. So the legislature passed AB5. Now Uber, Lyft and other delivery services are trying to get a carve out for their drivers saying their entire business model is based on independent contractors. What'd you guys do on this one? Uh, that, that was another head scratcher. We voted no on this one. Uh, we thought AB5 is sort of too much of a one size fits all bill, but we also thought that um, 20, Prop 22 was not a good solution to it. The problem with it is, is that Uber and Lyft and those guys are trying to buy their way into heaven with the uh, claim that they're getting, um, uh, they're going to provide 120% the area uh, minimum wage. And that sounds really good until you look at the fine print, which the fine print is, but at least a third of their time is not compensated. So depending on which set of numbers you choose to believe, and there's so many sets of numbers to pick from, it's hard to know, but somewhere in the ballpark, that's going to be 80% of uh, the, the minimum wage in, in real life as opposed to 120. The reality is, the other thing to sort of bug this, aside from, you know, it's easy not to like Uber, um, is that um, they're threatening to leave the state and say, we're out of here. We're going to take our ball and go home if this doesn't pass. We're the fifth largest economy in the state. Go home. In the world. You know, I don't know where that is. Um, you know, that would set a really bad precedent if all you have to do is uh, you don't like something, we're going to put it on the ballot and say we're going to leave. Um, I don't think they're going to go home. I think we're going to make it work. All right. So to date, just to note, Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and others have spent $190 million on advertising. Um, in the, I think our point there was if they spent $190 million on their workers in the first place, we wouldn't have to be talking about this now. All right. No on 22. I'm with you on that. Okay. Uh, very important, although, uh, you know, deceptively simple, is um, uh, Prop 16, which would repeal... Proposition 209, which, as you recall, was passed in 1996, uh, Nick. Uh, the anti-affirmative action measure. Right. Prohibits the use of race, sex, or ethnicity. And, and the big thing is in university admissions, but also in public employment, hiring, and contracting. Um, it's interesting because the polling on this, and you would think at a time of Black Lives Matter, uh, and, and anti-racist protests, people would be for this, but it's been very, very s slight, uh, like a third support. So even maybe, maybe people just don't know. Where, where, so are you, f yes, on 16 to repeal the ban on in affirmative action? Yeah, we, that was, we didn't really have a problem with this one. What it said is race, ethnicity, et cetera, can be used as a consideration. There's no um, quotas or any of that kind of stuff. There's no mandate. It's just something that you can consider. And when you think about, I mean, like all, all the studies coming out and all the scandals coming out regarding, um, uh, you know, university admissions these days and how rich kids are getting in through various back doors and side doors and front doors, 
obviously we already have an affirmative action program for rich people. It's called money. And so this is just a, another sort of how do we sort of equalize the playing field a little teeny tiny bit. And it seems us a no brainer. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm with you on that one too. All right. Uh, there's three issues affecting uh, sort of uh, law enforcement, crime, et cetera, et cetera. And I know you've spent a lot of quality time with Judge Eskin dis uh, discussing the, <laughs> the ins and outs, outs of these. Let's start with the big one, which is Prop 25. Um, this is a referendum, which is to say, in this case, the bail bond industry is trying to undo a law that the legislature passed, which is to ban cash bail. Uh, in other words, it would be up to the judge to decide uh, generally on other factors, uh, whether somebody is out on bail or is not out on bail. Um, so the cash bail industry has spent uh, 6.2 million uh, so far, excuse me, uh, 42 million so far to, to pass Prop 25, which would eliminate the no cash bail law. Where'd you come down on this? We came down in favor of the no cash bail. So you're, so you're yes on 25. We are yes on 25. We think, I mean, the bill was passed in, in, in 2018. It hasn't gone into effect yet because of this uh, proposition. I mean, I think it's incontrovertible that there's a huge inequality in uh, who gets uh, left in jail and who has to stay in jail, you know, pending their trial, who gets out. Uh, there's, it's, it's, it's like this, you know, it's like, so antiquated 300 years ago, it would have been embarrassing. But somehow or another, it was normalized. So we're trying this. And, you know, uh, so we think we should give this a, a shot and see what happens. I know that as we go ahead with it, we're going to find, oh, this doesn't work and that doesn't work. And it needs to be amended. It needs to be fixed and tweaked as we go. But doing it is a legislative process, not this yes, no, up, down of the uh, initiative process. Yeah, I mean, no. And, and you raise a good point about the context of this because, you know, California is really in the middle of this push-pull. It's been going on for some years about whether we are becoming more reformist on law enforcement or, you know, we're still in the three strikes uh, uh, era. And, we, you know, we've kind of been emerging from that, which brings us to property uh, Proposition 20, which is an attempt to roll back parts of Proposition 47 from 2014. This is a, a pr proposed by uh, DAs, sheriffs, law enforcement types uh, to make it uh, no early release for certain drug and property crimes. So certain things that had been turned into felonies are not going to be back to misdemeanors to simplify it. Uh, where, where, where are you on this one? Uh, we were against that one. Uh, we think uh, you know, I mean, one of the ones, one of the big ones in there it would be, I mean, right now in order to be charged as a felony for um, uh, theft, it has to be $950 or more. This would allow you to do it at 250 bucks. You know, wherever you draw the line is going to be arbitrary, and whoever gets ripped off for 250 bucks got ripped off. But we just think that we so overwhelmed the capacity of the state prison system. We built 14 new prisons, you know, in the past 30 years. We haven't built one new university. I mean, uh, you know, it's just the, the drain on resources without uh, the payoff in terms of safety uh, or, or, and with the recidivism rates that we've been seeing somewhere about 70%. It just seems like we need to move in the other direction and put our resources in rehabilitation and, and you know, whatever, you know, knowing that whatever we try is going to have mixed at best success rates. It, we're not going to turn things around overnight. But again, this is not, we got in this mess in the first place because we passed a bunch of bills, like three strikes by initiative. And, you know, it's like the initiative did not help. It was great for getting people elected at the time. Um, I know, you know, the pendulum is swinging back the other way, but again, this should be legislatively handled and not uh, by initiative. All right, and we should note here, uh, law enforcement uh, agencies, or not agencies, but uh, PACs have spent uh, 
$400,000 to pass this so far, 6.3 million against, led by none other than Mark Zuckerberg, uh, the head of uh, at Facebook, who is now styling himself as a criminal justice reformer. Okay, last one in this category is Prop 17. <sighs> and this would allow about 40,000 parolees whose parole has not been completed to vote. Uh, people who are on parole have completed parole are allowed to vote. People who are currently on uh, parole are not. It affects 40,000 people, as I said. It, 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 17 other states do this. Uh, you know, it's one of these, why, why is this on the ballot exactly? But wh where are you on this one? Uh, we, we rejected that one as well. I mean, we get the point, you know, people should finish their parole. But we, we think the broader impetus that we need to be moving towards is how do you, um, if you treat people like animals, they're going to act like animals. If you treat people like human beings, they're going to, the chances are better they're going to act like human beings. So if you want people to act like good citizens, you treat them like it. Well, wait, a always minute. Work. wait a minute, doesn't it? So Prop 13, I mean, Prop 17 would be treating people like human beings, would it not? No, no, it says you don't get to vote until you have completed your parole. I thought that was, I thought that was the existing law that you couldn't do it. And this was empowering people. Oh, I, I took it the other way. I have to go back and reread the fine print. All right. Well, Hold on, let me see what I got here. Put a, put a big question mark on Prop 17 for the moment. Oh, you know what then? I better go check on that. I, whatever we did. We, you were in favor of treating people. You were in favor whatever, of, of, we were We were in favor of letting people vote. All that right, was well, what that, we, would, that would be a yes vote. Okay. That would be a yes vote. Okay. All right. Um, now I'm going to talk about some things that I put in the category of why in the world are we voting on this? Okay, Proposition 18. Now this is interesting. It allows a big, huge problem, I'm sure. People who, we, people who are 18 are allowed to vote. This would allow people who are 17, but will be 18 by a general election to vote in a primary election. I don't know how many people this affects. I don't see it it's as about 30,000. 30, 30, Thanks for checking that. Okay, this was put on the ballot by the efforts of uh, one assemblyman, Kevin Mullen from San Mateo. He's been trying to get it on the ballot forever. And not only that, but before that, his father, who had the seat before him, Gene Mullen, was trying to get it on the ballot. So this is 20 years in the making. So are you for Kevin Mullen's? effort on behalf of a small number of 17 year olds yes or no on prop 18 that that was a resounding emphatic yes it's like yeah let's go i mean really uh you know clearly they have exhausted the legislative remedies available to them i you know i they must have been there with the people who wanted to uh, repeal daylight savings you know okay i'm a resounding no on this because i've I've raised 17 year olds. <laughs> okay, but I, I, I was with you until I read the argument and, the, and, and it was really the grumpy white man article argument, which was like, um, the, the 17 year old brain is not equipped and besides they're gonna be voting on such things as property taxes. Now, the reality is the human brain is not really set until you turn 25. If you wanna look at you know, when the brain is mature, so if you want to get into the biology of the human brain, we're going to have to set voting back to the age of 25. And right. since we're not going to do that, open the door. Okay, well, listen, you know, if there was an initiative to do that, I might, I might, <laughs> I might be for it. But all right, so you're, you're yes on 18. Put Kevin Mullen out of his misery. Okay. Yes, and ours that, as well. The one that leads off of all things, Proposition 14, uh, and this goes back to Proposition 71 from 2004, which I know you recall also, which established the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, which allows them to uh, deliver grants to people doing stem cell 
research. They got five and a half million dollars in bonds at that time. Uh, now they're asking for another uh, three billion. Excuse me, they got three billion. They're down to 132. Now they want another five and a half. Uh, so wh wh where'd you come down on this? Our, our argument is we gave already. And we gave back no, in the, on, no on fourteen. We said no on this. We said we we, we said yes back in, in uh, you know two thousand and four. You got three billion bucks. If you haven't figured out how to make partnerships uh, happen in the meantime, don't come to us. If you're on your own, excellent. And I think the voters are going to agree with you because it's the first thing they're going to see. Give us some money for something that some people are still a little dicey about. This is going to be the embryonic, uh, right. And in the in the economic times, it's not going to go well. Now, my favorite uh, one of why are we voting on this is uh, Proposition 23 to increase dialysis regulation. First of all, we just voted on this thing. Second of all, it's a it's basically a management labor fight between the SEIU and the two uh, 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 companies that operate two biggest for-profit dialysis clinic. Clinics, Davita Inc. and Fresenius Medical. You know, take it outside, guys. You know, I, I don't feel equipped, honestly, hey. as a voter to, to decide on the protocols for dialysis clinics. Uh, well, where did you come down on this one? Well, we broke with a lot of people here. We actually said yes. Oh, my and, goodness. And I, okay, let me tell you, and I, and we, I must confess, are fundamentally incompetent to render an informed opinion. But I did talk to somebody who uh, has had four kidney transplants and is a, was a frequent flyer in the, the uh, dialysis clinic for a long time. Uh, and he told me, he said, no, man, you know, mo many of them are great, but uh, a lot of them really stink and it depends what neighborhood you're in. He said he was sitting next to somebody when they died and the person next to them died it was because they were not running the machines the way they should have been run at the time. And I don't know if having a position on site would have been good enough, but it suggests that, you know, they need to have a little bit more of a investment of, of skilled medical professionals uh, in these clinics. And there's two companies that have a complete lock on the, the market. So they probably can afford it. Now, the other little detail, which they don't like in this one, is it also says, not only do you have to have extra doctors, but you have to accept Medi-Cal Medicare. And, and so it increases their costs by, by having extra staffing, but it says they have to take payment from uh, Medi-Cal, which typically lowballs the doctors. So they're going to get less of a profit margin. But they got such a monopoly, I figured, you know what? They should All right, pay. let me ask you this. What position did you take the last time this was on the ballot? I have no idea. <laughs> I think we said no. I think you I said think no, said too. No. I think you <laughs> said no, too. Okay. Really, that shouldn't be, I, I would say maybe half of these shouldn't be on here. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. It, you know, I mean, if we were really, um, uh, you know, had the, the courage of our conviction, we would just say, Half of them were just going to vote no on because they shouldn't be here in the first place. The legislature should deal with it. All right. And then I'm gonna, the last one is, is, to me, the ultimate head scratcher. Proposition 24, uh, which would amend the California Consumer Privacy Act, which has just recently, I think in the last two years, taken effect. This is another vanity project, I think. It's, there's a, uh, some... Uh, Silicon Valley zillionaire Alistair McTaggart, who had the original idea for this Privacy Act, was going to do an initiative in 2018, uh, finagled with the legislature so they would pass it. Now he's coming back. He doesn't think it's strong enough. He spent five and a half million dollars so far to pass this. I know you talked to State Senator Hannibeth Jackson about this, who was very involved in the uh, in the in the writing of the Privacy Act, where are you on this one? Yes or no? We voted yes on this one, and I will say that when we spoke with uh, Hannah Beth Jackson, uh, she was highly equivocal in terms of which way she was going to go. But what, what she convinced us 
was that the uh, susceptibility of the legislature uh, to the lobbying forces of the data gathering industry, uh, they would not be able to withstand it. And that the legislation as passed was going to be weakened and watered down. Inevitably, she had no confidence it would stand. Um, she had some serious issues with Prop 24, but she, she, she gave me the distinct impression that 24 was going to be less susceptible to lobbying. So if you cared about uh, privacy issues, however imperfect it is, I, I walked away with the, the belief, yeah, we'll go with that one. Yeah. We both it's hard to imagine anybody voting against consumer privacy. Um, right. But, I, you know, it might be one. It's very, it's very well, you know, people are scratching their heads. But so this guy had the original idea. Then he got it watered down in the legislature. Now he wants he's kind of back to his original idea. It, it does establish a new bureaucracy, I guess, to uh, to oversee these issues. You know, you know and that's, yeah, that's going to be such a shakedown. Can you imagine the people, the, the, the articles that we're going to be reading about uh, improper payments and, and gifts and travel? I mean, it's just, it's like a, the Department of Graft and Corruption, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm the guy who, you know, when they put the disclaimer up that says, you know, do you agree that we can have all of you and your children's information forever? I just hit yes, because it's like, it's annoying to have to deal with that kind of stuff. But yeah, okay, so you're for consumer privacy. Okay, so just to recap, you're no on the stem cell bonds, Proposition 14. Your right. yes on the split roll to uh, raise yeah. taxes for uh, commercial uh, 15. Uh, 15, yes. Prop 16, affirmative action, your yes. Prop 17, to let parolees vote, you're confused about yeah. what you did, so just yeah. read, read the paper on that one. <laughs> Prop 18, your yes on the Kevin Mullen Relief Act to allow 17-year-olds <laughs> to vote early. Uh, uh, Prop 19, uh, which is, uh, uh, what is that one? That's, uh, oh, that's the weird Prop 13 Sorry. elephant Actually, in the dark yeah. measure. You're no on because it's too confusing. The loophole. Prop Everybody. 20, to toughen uh, penalties for certain crimes, you're no independence for crime. Prop 21, uh, rent control, no, because uh, we got to give the other one time to breathe. Prop 22, uh, to uh, give Uber and Lyft a carve out, your no. Uh, yeah. Prop uh, 23, the dialysis clinics, your yes, because you talked to a guy who had somebody <laughs> who died next to him. I got it. <laughs> not, not only I mean, legislation by initiative, <laughs> but by anecdotal <laughs> initiative. Okay, prop, prop 24. Uh, the consumer uh, protection thing you're yes on, and Prop 25 to allow cash bail, you are yes. Yeah, and to go back to the point that you just made there, um, yes, based on one stupid anecdote, we made that decision. But let me tell you something here. The really striking thing this year, I mean, it's always been this case, but trying to get reliable information from somebody who doesn't have an immediate dog in the hunt. I find has gotten so much harder. So for example, um, one of the big issues on Prop uh, 15 is whether or not vineyards and orchards are gonna be taxed more. I called up this, the, the county assessor, Joe Hahn. It's his job to know. What do you know, Joe? I don't know, he says. I, what do you mean you don't know? He goes, you know, it, maybe it's passed, maybe it won't. We don't know. Um, I call up uh, the Ag Commissioner. What do you know? We don't know. I called the county executive. Mm, uh, haven't heard back. Um, these are all, so of course, Doss Williams, who was all for it, said, no, don't worry about it. Of course, the, the, the uh, you know, uh, growers and shippers uh, are all, oh my God, it's the end of the world. But the same people that are saying it's the end of the world here are the ones saying, they're coming for your homes next. This is just a slippery slope of the camel's nose under the tent. And before you know it, Granny's out in the street. And it's just, there is 
such a paucity of reliable third party objective distance information. Yeah. Well, I am slowly slogging through all 6,862 words. Uh, so that's why I say I haven't made up my mind in this. On the natural, you know, I'd be for it, but um, it's just uh, the devil may be in the details on this one. And, and the time is just like, really, well, you're going to drop it I mean, On the one hand, the timing's very good because as you remember, the legislature and the governor passed the budget assuming there was going to be more federal money coming uh, for, for a pandemic relief. And I think there was an $11 billion hole in there or something. Well, there isn't going to be any more by October 15th, or at least it didn't look like it, the House passed, uh, I think, $2.2 trillion, but, you know, the Senate's too busy jamming through the Supreme Court thing, and now the President's got COVID, and, you know, who the hell knows, but it doesn't, there's not going to be any more pandemic relief. So right. the no, Democrats right. are now saying, we got to wait, we got to elect Biden, and then we'll do something there, but in the meantime, yeah, the state could sure use the money for schools and other things. But the other is, do you want to drop this big bomb into the, the state economy at right. a time when it's still being ravaged? So it's really a difficult call. I, it, you know, it, I've been surprised, it, it, again, by the polling on this. Uh, I think uh, PPIC had 49%, 51% yes, which is not really a lot at this point. And then the UC poll had less than that, but it had a bigger undecided. So I think they got the work cut out for them to, to pass it. Uh, 50 million has been spent for yes so far by the unions, 35 million against by the chamber and the retailers. But that number is going to grow. It's going to yeah. really get big uh, between now and then. So uh, that's I would be a big one. That I, I, I don't, I'm skeptical it's going to get there yeah that's the big one prop 15. so listen brother you're doing the lord's work uh you uh you do this so the voters don't have to uh thank you for your time and and your thoughtfulness and going through all these things and your insights um the independent is out now has all these uh uh endorsement recommendations correct everything yeah. The Scalita School Board, which I'm hearing from. Well, I assume you related because Delaney did that uh, did that uh, thing the other night, right? Yeah, we're, that should be up. Uh, the other one that will be coming up, and we're endorsing in the uh, City College uh, Board of uh, Directors as well. That should be coming up any second. And you uh, moderated uh, uh, an event uh, last night, a forum last night for all those candidates. Did yeah. You know yeah. I did. And uh, what, uh, can you tell us who you're endorsing where for that, or do you want to wait till it's out online? Uh, let's wait till it comes out online. But okay. yeah, I mean, basically what we did, we uh, wait till it comes out online. All right. Okay. Yeah. How was, how was the, uh, how was the forum? Were any fireworks? No, there wasn't any fireworks. Um, it was interesting. I, I, I realize it's a lot harder to do those things than it looks. Oh, yeah. um, and, uh, you know, my gifts as a moderator uh, were not in uh, great form and in terms of trying to, you know, interrupt people when they're just sort of giving word salad. I think that's the hard part. Um, you know, you, you don't want to intrude too much because it's their show, but at the same time, they got to actually be clear. And there was a lot of gobbledygook um, that I should have intruded on more than I did. Well, it's um, hard to do it on Zoom. I mean, it's I mean, it's hard enough to yeah. do it in person, but when you can't read, you know, the kind of clues and verbal, you know, or use your body language and stuff, it's really difficult. You got six people. Yeah. yeah. Would you agree with me, however, Nick? that um, the, uh, <laughs> the fundamental underlying issue uh, on the conflicts both here and I think in the county board of um, education race is uh, critical race theory and whether uh, uh, things like ethnic studies and, and, and so on uh, should be based on critical race theory or not. 
you know, I, I, I would split the hair with you here. I don't know the extent to which critical race theory, you know, as, as sort of as your bugaboo has really been embraced by, say, Celeste Barber and Ron Lichty and, and Veronica Gallardo. They are much more concerned. Those three, for example, refuse, um, you know, express opposition to a, a resolution uh, denouncing police brutality and expressing support for Black Lives Matter. But Black Lives Matter at that point was lower face Black Lives Matter. It wasn't the whole agenda, uh, however that actually is. And uh, so they did not, when they voted, uh, embrace defund me, to fund the police, for example. Um, so to the extent to which the opposition uh, which would be, you know, Veronica and uh, uh, Celeste and Ron. I don't know if, if they are, you know, uh, you know how unified they are and, and, and their thinking, and I don't know how unified behind the critical race theory the, uh, the the board members are who supported this resolution. I think there's a recognition by a lot of people who don't necessarily embrace critical race theory uh, that. Police brutality, especially where black people is concerned, has just gotten out of fucking hand and we need to do something about it. And I just think that George Floyd was a pivotal moment. And I, and so, you know, I know within that subtext, which is very, you know, written with a big paintbrush, there, there is a critical race theory part, which gets, you know, a little bit hard to take for a lot of people. You know, that's an element in the picture, but I think the picture is bigger than that. Yeah, no, I, 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 it's not a bugaboo of mine. It's my, my, it's just my belief that people who have been thinking about these issues for a long time, uh, including Black Lives Matter people and so on, have a have a, a, a dramatically different way of looking at racial issues than has been the case, uh, you know, for a long for a long time, based on social. Uh, uh, sociology constructions of classes rather than individuals, and that that's at the heart of the conflict. And and that's yeah. I, my you know I I have not learned enough about it yet to write about it, but I want to write about it because I do think that's a clarifying issue for for people to to just talk about. So right, no, I, I think there's there's a, a big disconnect, and and then you know. On any campus, you know, there's a, a hyper purity that, yes. you know, where the politics on campuses, I mean, it's just a, that's the way it is on campus. And um, I think it's certainly the, the case at, you know, City College. I mean, really one of the most interesting characters in this race is Celeste Barber. And Celeste Barber has now become sort of the, the weeping Joan of Arc with the American flag and the Pledge of Allegiance on Fox News. And so she's become this right-wing uh, meme. But the reality is she is a card-carrying, you know, pro-union Democrat for most of her life. Uh, she uh, marched against the war uh, on, on Iraq, you know. Uh, she uh, was, you know, was a, you know, demonstrated on behalf of abortion rights. Um, she, she's totally pro-union. Um, and, um, you know, in Lompoc, when she lived there in the 90s, she ran a house uh, for um, you know, you know, mothers uh, with uh, you know, drug, addicted, drug addicted mothers and their children, so that those moms, overwhelmingly women of color, weren't put in jail. So you, know, you look at her life trajectory, she's not this right winger, but she believes in free speech. And so her free speech is much more all right, you got to let the, the crazy people, you know, who are right wingers have some speech too. And that has sort of put her on the fringe um, and has now been pushed off the edge so that now she has become, you know, Joan of Arc of Fox News. Yeah. No, that's a, that's a, that's a great uh, uh, explanation about it. And it, and it really is, um, you know, we keep, you know, this cliche, we need to have a conversation about race. But people like Celeste, I think when she begins to have the conversation, it, you know, she, it, people want to just shut her down and say, well, that just, 
proves that you're right. So, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. So anyway, thanks for your time, brother. Stay safe out there. Uh, remember what happened to the president of the United States and uh, <laughs> wear your mask. You know, wear your mask. Wear your mask. Um, you know what, I wonder what Fauci's going to say tonight. <laughs> you know, for October surprise, you know, I had two things. Uh, you know, maybe a Supreme Court justice would die and one of the candidates would get uh, uh, COVID. COVID. And uh, it's only October 2nd. So <laughs> we, got a, we got a ways to go. Uh, I'll talk to you. Thanks. All right, man. You take care.